Now I want to start off with a little story about my final mile of, uh, well it really wasn't the final mile, it was the whole mile. So I like Jim. Jim is pretty good, right? Yes or yes? Yes. Yes. No. no. Okay. I have a love and hate relationship with Jim. I love the games, I love going outside, I love doing all those things, but then there was the presidential fitness test. Do you guys remember that? Or do you still have that? So, and then also, I hated the part that was the mile run. Looking at me, I'm not built to run a mile. So, I would get very anxious about the final, oh, this, this uh, final part of the test of the fin uh, presidential fitness test. And um, I went to Gibraltar School and we uh, were right next to State Park. And as part of that run, we would run through the park. Um, so that was very nice, comparatively to running around the track four times. I remember preparing for the run. I would try to run short distances to build up my endurance. I would try to eat right. Um, I would make sure my shoes were broken in. But every time I would come to the mile, I was so scared because I knew it was something that I didn't want to do. Um, I didn't want to do it at all. And we'd start off by lining up and then they would fire the starter's pistol and I would always wait for the end because I didn't want to slow anyone else up. Now, going through the first part of the first two thirds of the mile run was okay. We were in the shade, we were in the forest, nobody could see you doing, like if you decided to dog it a little bit, you decided to walk a little bit, um, it wasn't so uh, embarrassing. But the last part of this mile, the final part of the mile, you came out of the forest and you had to run one lap around the track and then uh, around to the end. And I remember my last time doing this as a senior in high school, um, coming out of the forest and it being just so, so hot. It was a hot spring day. And coming out and running and realizing that my side was starting to hurt. And I was starting to get a side stitch. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. It's where your side just starts aching. And I remember walking and huffing and puffing and walking back into uh, walking the rest of the mile. That was my final mile. Um, I don't know if I've run a mile since then, at least at one time. Um, as with any event, I would get ready early. I would try to be easy at the beginning, but I would find the last part of it was full of pain and suffering. I can't tell you how much I hate the mile run. I hate it, 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 I hate it. But it was something that had to be gone through. Now, there was a finish line to the mile run, and the finish line that we're looking like at in life is what? What is our hope for our finish line? Anybody remember? Beth just mentioned it earlier. Where are we hoping to go after we die? Heaven. Heaven. Yes. The journey to get there, though, is something that we need to understand, that the journey to heaven is sometimes filled with um, very difficulties, with suffering and with uh, illness. And these last years can be very difficult. Um, I'm going through that with my own mom right now. She is, uh, you know, there's a point in which your parents start to um, fail and they start to suffer and it's a hard thing to see but regardless of whether our suffering happens in the final mile or before that one thing to remember is that jesus is with us in the suffering regardless of when we suffer 
when we are ill, when we are hurt, Jesus is there with us in the suffering. Suffering is a part of life. So suffering is a part of life because the world is imperfect because of original sin. The world is imperfect because of original sin. So that is why there is suffering and death and uh, suffering and death and illness. Suffering can be lead us to two ways of thinking of it. It can lead us to sadness and despair. We can say, Lord, why me? Or why the person I love? Who here has had somebody suffer in their life? Yeah. We say, why? So we can inwardly turn towards ourselves and isolate ourselves from God. Or if we remember that Jesus Christ is with us, we can turn towards God and say, Lord, help me. Lord, I need you. Jesus doesn't want us to do it alone. He is our God. And that's why he became a human being. He became a human being that he might walk our walk, talk our talk, live our life, die our death. That he might know what it means to be God but also a human being to know what it means to suffer, to be sick. And we see this in these coming weeks, the coming week in which Jesus will suffer, be humiliated, and will eventually die. But the nice thing is three days he rose again from the dead. He did this all so that our suffering would not be meaningless. He did it and he did it well. And we are called to do the same, that we should surround, surround those who are suffering, those who are sick with our prayers and with our petitions and with our love, just as Jesus is with us as well. One way that Jesus heals and reminds us of his presence is through the sacrament of anointing of the sick. Now, paragraph 1511 states of the Catholic Catechism of the Catholic Church that the Church believes and confesses that among the seven sacraments, there is one especially that strengthens those who are, tied, who are, who are tried by illness, anointing of the sick. The anointing of the sick comes from Jesus Christ and is given to his church. It is the proper sacrament of the New Testament and is found in the Gospel of Mark, or at least alluded to in the Gospel of Mark and really found in the letter to St. James. In the letter of St. James it says, chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, If there is anyone suffering among you, let them send for the priests of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick persons and the Lord will raise them up. If they have committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven them. So with anointing of the sick, a number of things can happen. A person can be physically healed. We see throughout the Gospels, that's what Jesus does. He heals people, body, heals their body, heals their, uh, heals them, um, heals them as well as as heals their souls as well. The sacrament of anointing of the sick is for us to be healed of body and spirit. It is for those who are seriously ill or close to death. It entrusts them to Jesus. Again, when we are sick, when we are alone, or when we are sick, when we are in illness, Jesus is with us. It helps the person to have strength and peace and courage through their sufferings without falling into the temptations and discouragements and fear of death. Who here is afraid of death? Raise your hand if you're honest. That is how we get prepared. For nobody, for many people are afraid of death, even those people with faith. Jesus is the divine physician. He loves you all. He loves you all. And we are made up of body and souls. We're not just souls trapped in a body. We're not just bodies. 
that we have souls and we have bodies and that Jesus wants to heal them both. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus heals the bodies. He heals people that can't walk, people that can't hear, people that can't see. He heals the souls. He says to those who are possessed by demons, be free. He says to the paralytic man, your sins are forgiven you. He uses different ways in which to bring about healing. He even touches a person's eyes and makes saliva and makes clay. Jesus uses physical means. We see this in the gospel that we, he touches the people that he needs to heal. And we see it over and over, though, that Jesus heals spiritually first. He tells the people that they have been forgiven their sins, and then he feels them physically. And because Jesus has the first victory over sin and death, not the first he's victory over sin and death, not all people are healed physically, but they are always healed spiritually. In suffering of the sick, the church can be greatly helped when they, we unite our sufferings with that of Jesus Christ. So our sufferings are not, are, for not, are, not, are not for nothing. They can be united with Jesus Christ. So Jesus wants to heal us now. He continues to heal us now. Uh, we had that healing ministry the other night. He passes on this ability to heal to his apostles. He says in Mark 16, 17 through 18, in my name they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And this ability to heal has been given to the church to be carried out through the sacraments, through the healing touch. In this case, the ministry of healing is passed to us through anointing of the sick. This is how anointing of the sick is conferred. So usually I get called to the hospital or to a person in hospice or a person in the nursing home. And I approach them and I talk to them, obviously. And as part of the anointing of the sick, we pray some prayers at the beginning. And then we lay our hands on their forehead. And that we are praying for the healing of their body mind and spirit and after we're done praying for them we place our thumb into the oil of heat uh, oil of the sick and we place a little bit of oil on their foreheads and we say be please be through this holy anointing may the lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the holy spirit and then with more oil we place on their hands and we say May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. And people can be healed. I'm thinking of a friend of mine who has an aunt in her 60s. Now this aunt was feeling unwell. And she went to the doctor and they scanned and they did their scans and they found her body riddled with cancer. There wasn't much that they could do for her and they said that she had a month to live. So they prayed. She received anointing of the sick. And she determined she was going to live out that last month very well. And she did. And she lived for one month. And she wasn't getting that much sicker. She lived for two months. And she was okay. She lived for three months. And finally her husband said to her, you better go to the doctor and get this checked out again. And there was no cancer. Through the healing power of Jesus Christ, this woman was healed of cancer. And this happens many, many times. There's places in the world in which healings happen on a regular basis. Lourdes, France, where people bathe themselves in the waters that Mary, uh, Mary, that Mary had pointed out that Jesus has blessed. 
Here in our area, there's a place called Champion, Robinsonville, Our Lady of Good Help, the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help. And if you go into the basement, you find all these crutches from people that had gone there needing them, but they were healed by the Lord Jesus Christ through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. They were able to walk. They didn't need to use their crutches anymore. So sometimes we are physically healed. A second story I want to share with you is one of Mike. Now, I was a pastor up north in Lakewood, and Mike was one of my parishioners. And he was sick one weekend. He was very, very sick. And he came to the hospital and found out his immune system was just gone. And again, there was nothing that could be done for him. So he asked for me to give him anointing of the sick. And to be honest, he was really scared. Before the anointing, he was scared of death, and rightfully so. And after I anointed him, he felt better. He was able to face death. There was strife in his family. His family was at odds. After I was anointed, anointed him, he was able to come to some coming together of family. He ended up dying a couple days later. But we see the spiritual healing that goes on. Who can receive anointing of the sick? It's for anyone in danger of death, gravely ill, or, old, or those who are of old age or before a serious operation. And it can be done as many times as needed. The person that celebrates the sacrament is a priest or a bishop. And it's highly recommended that it be done in a broader community, such as the church or with family and friends. This is so everyone can surround them with their prayers. Anointing the sick given to those who are near death is to withstand the final struggles that come with facing death. There also we can do reconciliation with them, so the final uh, forgiveness of sins. And also we can do viaticum, which is giving the Eucharist to them um, before they die. Viatica means food for the journey, and that's why we did our uh, no-bake uh, power bites. Anointing of the sick may heal us, but it prepares us for heaven, for the final mile. The anointing of the sick reminds us that God is with us, regardless of whether we feel it or not. That God is with us in our trials and in our sufferings. That he has gone through the same things as we have. And in our sufferings that we unite them with Jesus Christ, who experienced pain and suffering for each and every one of us. With Jesus, we can see that suffering, and suffering has meaning and a purpose. And through suffering, we're brought closer to Jesus. Who knows what it is like to suffer when we unite our sufferings with Jesus's sufferings and pray for others in the midst of their pain we can give our suffering more meaning the anointing of the sick is for people as a way it helps people to offer their suffering in this way and we can even um, and as we continue running our race to heaven we can always remember through anointing of the sick that we're never alone even in times of hardship and suffering, Jesus and the church are with you. So regardless of whether there is suffering or not um, happening in our final mile of our lives, Jesus is with us. And Jesus is with us in the suffering. The ability to pass on the healing touch of Jesus has been passed on through the anointing of the sick. We unite our suffering with Jesus, 